Wow. Wow. Man, I am so excited for this uh, episode three. I'm going to call it, uh, some people, you mean like Esther series, like part, I know mean, oh, this, is, this is episode. Anybody loving this story? This is a great story. And Esther's just like weaving, bobbing, and flowing. People are like, I had no idea the Bible was so cool. <laughs> but uh, before I jump in, you know, I have uh, one of the, I told you a couple weeks ago in my sermon that, uh, man, we live in an area. Has anybody been able to tell that traffic is getting a little ridiculous just by a show of hands? Anybody losing their salvation every day about 5, 15? People moving down here from every, I'm like, what is going on? And I told you, man, that like, uh, you think about all the churches we have in South Florida, what we need is more churches. We need more people getting saved. And, uh, and I always wanna be that, that sending church. And we have a, a couple in our church that, man, has been coming to Anchor for a couple years, talking about serving in worship, serving in young adults, uh, serving on platform, greeting, serving wherever necessary. And uh, Brandon and Nicole, come up here, come up here, come up here. And Brandon and Nicole, gosh, uh, several months ago, felt the call of God on their hearts to start a church. And you guys come up, come up here. And uh, so what you might not know is this is kind of crazy. I, I talk to people all the time that say, um, man, I'd love to come to Anchor, but y'all move a little too far, far south for me. And I say, where do you live? They say, oh, we live in uh, West Palm. It's, it's a good 10 minutes. And uh, <laughs> I'm saying a, a church alive is worth the drive, but um, they drive every week from Port St. Lucie. Yeah, and uh, Brandon is a police officer. Nicole's a school teacher. And uh, yes, yeah, let's go. And uh, you know, they have felt like God has put a call in their life to plant a church up in Port St. Lucie. And I said, man, as much as we love Brandon and Nicole, I thought, I wanna be a church that sends you out to give you a blessing on your life. Cause I'm like, dude. So I'm so excited uh, for them. And I mean, Teresa and then we know what that's like, you know, to, uh, to be like, what's, what's next, God? We know you're calling, but okay. Um, what do we do? And, uh, you know, you have your, uh, your, your jobs by day, ministry by day, salvations by day. Uh, your, your parents, you have so much stuff happening, but we want you to know Anchor Church is behind you. Anchor Church is with you. Anchor Church is in support of you. And so, uh, we are, uh, we're not gonna see them every single weekend. They'll be here as much as they can. I was asking Nicole, even when you and Brandon start the church, can you still come and sing on Sundays? Um, I said, he'll be fine, he'll be fine. Uh, you can sing, oh, you can definitely sing, you can preach. But uh, I just thought as a church, I wanna be able to pray for them. And their church is gonna be tribe church. How cool is that? Tribe, three tribe. I wanna be a part of that just for the name. It's like anchor or three tribe, three tribe. Um, but we wanna pray for you. And uh, they're gonna start, you'll start seeing more of what they're doing on Instagram as they jump in here in June. And, uh, but we want you to know as a church, we're with you. We're your home church, but we're sending you. We're with it. We're praying for you. We're all about it. And so can you all just extend a hand? God, thank you for this amazing, amazing family. I thank you for Elle. I thank you for Brandon and Nicole. I thank you for their ministry, their heart for ministry. I think, God, I pray you just bless them for all the gas they've been using getting down here every single week. But I just, I think about their heart for ministry, serving in any capacity wherever we needed them. God, there's a blessing on their life. We've known it from the first time we met them. There's an anointing on them and we know what you're gonna do in them and through Three Tribe Church is going to be incredible. And so would they know every single Sunday, every single Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that Anchor Church is behind them. Anchor Church is with them. Anchor Church is cheering them on from an hour away, God. We say yes to the call in their lives. And it's in your name we pray, amen. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Oh, I love you guys so much. Woo, I am so excited for you guys. And uh, listen, y'all wanna start churches? You just let us know. We're gonna be sending people out because I'm telling you, I do not wanna be that church. I, we, we're set, I want churches. We need churches in South Florida. We need, we need people coming to faith in Jesus. It's not about competition. It's about celebration. And so, man, that, there's no competition in the kingdom of God. I'm like, let's go, let's go. And um, all right, enough crying. My gosh, here we go. Teresa got me started, then we sing that song, and I'm like, dear Jesus, we gotta 
Quick joke. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> here we go. Episode three of, of Esther. And uh, let, me, let me recap the series. If you've missed any of the series, all right, you can go back to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe. You can check it out. But I'm going to give you, I, I, I told Teresa, I wanted to give you like a quick synopsis of all we've talked about in a sentence of each character. So if you are new, you're like, what I miss? You're going to catch it all right here. First, you have a guy by the name of King Xerxes. King Xerxes was insecure. Here's the sermon in a sentence that you have to understand about him. He boots out his wife in a moment of rage. He's having a party. He wants his wife, Queen Vashti, to come in wearing nothing but her royal crown. And she's like, nope. And uh, so he, he kicks her out. There's another guy by the name of Haman. Haman is arrogant and he vows to kill all the Jews in a moment of pride. He wants every single person to bow before him when they walk by. There's a guy named Mordecai. He will not bow. Mordecai is a Jew. And Haman goes, it's not enough that I would just kill Mordecai. I'm wiping out his whole race. Then you've got Mordecai, who is faithful, he saves the king's life in a moment of truth. We talked about that last week. You've got Esther, who becomes the queen. She takes Vashti's place. She's willing. She becomes the new queen in a moment of faith. And the overall character that you hear his name not one time mentioned, but yet is all throughout this story, it is God. He's always present, and he becomes glorified because of a lifetime of faithfulness. Now, this is the story of Esther in a sentence. God is at work in your life even when you can't see him. I think it's so stinking cool that God's name is never mentioned through the book of Esther, although you know that God is working in Esther because the way that God moves in her and through her is so evident that you and I can look and go, that's God. But God never says, look at me. And I love that in our lives because many of us can see the working of God in our lives and we can see God moving and other people might go, there's something about you. I don't know what it is. Ah, it's Jesus. He moving. His name is power. That, that, that's, that's what it's all about. Because just, you, you, you can't see him moving, but just because you can't see him moving doesn't mean he's not moving. I don't, I don't feel God. Just because you don't feel him doesn't mean he's not moving. Just because you don't sense him doesn't mean he's not moving. We sang that song, Speak Jesus, and I started getting goosebumps. And you might go, I like that feeling. That ain't a feeling. That's a presence. That's the presence of God. Don't, don't confuse the two. Feeling come and go. Presence falls. That's what happened in the upper room, man. Acts chapter two. Like, what just happened? That was a feeling. That wasn't a feeling. You're not having a tongue of fire over your head from a feeling. That's the presence of God. That's the presence of God. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not working. You know, uh, years ago, years ago, Teresa and I have a, a good friend. He's a top ENT in the world. Like this guy's like top ear, nose, and throat specialist on the planet. I think he was like the ear, nose, and throat specialist, like the king of Saudi Arabia, the prince of Saudi Arabia or something like that. And, and, and we were getting sick a lot. You know, you get in that season where it's like allergies, get all bad and all that kind of stuff. And, and he says to us, he goes, um, do you have vitamin C with rose hips? No. I have vitamin C. Uh, uh. Vitamin C with rose hips. I don't know what that means. He goes, when you start getting sick, when you feel it, you feel it, you need to get some 1,000 milligram vitamin C with rose hips. It's like rose petals all ground up, put into the vitamin C. He's like, you, you overdose on vitamin C with rose hips for about three days. So every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, for three days, you take four pills. And in three days, everyone always says to me, Sean, you never get sick. What happened? Rose hips. Because <laughs> you feel something coming on. You just start. Now, now, can I tell you? I have no idea how it works. Some people are like, what's the rose hip do? How come four pills three times a day? I ain't questioning the doctor. All I know is it works. Just because I don't see it working doesn't mean I'm not healthy. And I think many of us go, I don't see God working, so is he doing anything? And I'm like, we can see it. And if he tells me he's working, I'm gonna trust the great physician that he's working. There's times in our life where we're just, I don't, I don't know if it's evident. I don't know if God's doing anything. God's, God's doing something. We can see it. But just because you don't see it, if the great physician says, do it, can I tell you straight up, I'm going to do it. 
And how do I know he's working? Because my Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it also says that God said, I will never leave you and never abandon you. So if God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, the same God that was with Esther and Mordecai in the palace is the same God that's with you this morning at 10 a.m. So I know he's working. He's working in you and he's working in Esther. And I know beyond a shadow of doubt, because my Bible says in Romans chapter eight that God works all things together for the good. You mean, Sean, it's all good? I didn't say it's all good. I said he's working all things together for the good. And notice not one place in Romans chapter eight does it say immediately. Anybody ever get frustrated, God? God, I've been going through this. Just spank me and get it over with. Stop grounding me. <laughs> God's like, but, but I'm teaching you. And I'm working all things together for the good. You know why? It's because it's the struggle that makes you stronger. It's the burden that makes you bolder. You know how Esther got so stinking bold? God going, I'm in the scenes here, but behind the scenes, let's see what happens when you get to work because you just have the confidence that I'm with you. Now, let's, 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 let's set this week up, right? We know God's working. We know God's moving. Remember, uh, Haman wanted everyone to bow. Mordecai, we talked about this last week, Mordecai would not, would not bow. He's like, I don't bow to you. I bow to one king. And, and Morde, Mordecai was like, forget that. Haman goes, I'm, I'm wiping him out. I'm wiping out all the Jews. Remember, he, he goes to the king Xerxes and says, is it okay with you? Xerxes says, yeah, absolutely. He didn't say it's Mordecai. Now, remember, Esther is also a Jew. She's Mordecai's cousin, but the king Xerxes didn't know this yet. She's holding her cards close. And so Haman goes, I'm gonna wipe them all out. A year from now, we're gonna wipe them all out. And anybody that kills any Jew in their presence can have all their property. Mordecai gets just mortified by this. He's like, what am I gonna do? He goes down to the palace and weeps. Esther gets word to him, goes, what's going on with you? He's like, all of our people are gonna get wiped out. You gotta go to the king. And Esther goes, you don't just go to the king. But you just don't walk into the king. The king will kill you if he wants to, unless he holds out a gold scepter. And if he holds out a gold scepter, then that means you can come into his presence. But Esther goes, but I haven't seen the king in 30 days. He has not called for me in 30 days. So I don't know what to do, but here's what we're gonna do. Esther says, go get word to Mordecai that we're all, you and all the Jews, me and all my, my servants, we're gonna pray and fast for three days. Because I don't know what to do. Anybody ever go in those moments where you're like, God, I know you're in control, but I don't know what is happening. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray. You pray. I'm gonna pray. We're gonna fast, and in three days, I'm going to the king. Now, I started thinking this week, what happens when you and I know God's at work, but don't see God at work? How do we trust him to work? I mean, how do we live that life of trust when you know he's working, but you don't see him working? What do we do? Anybody ever wanna know that one? I mean, Sean, come on, help me out here. We're gonna look at the story today and see what Esther did because I think you and I can learn a lot about this. When you and I know God's working, but we have a hard time trusting the fact that God's working, here's what we gotta do. You always prepare in prayer before you jump with passion. Always prepare with prayer. We always think prayer is a last resort. Prayer is your first response. Always. Why? Because prayer gets you aligned with what the Holy Spirit wants, not with what you want you know what I didn't want to do? Start a church. I start praying. God goes, you're going to start a church. No, I'm not. I keep praying. God goes, yes, you are. What happened was my humanity was here. The Holy Spirit was there. And the prayer aligned my heart with what God wanted in my path. And Esther goes, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to pray. Look what happens here, Esther chapter four. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. Mordecai's talking here. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this? Then Esther sent a reply back to Mordecai, go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast. Now notice, fast, I don't see prayer. Prayer is always implied with fasting. You wouldn't just fast and be like, why am I doing this? You're fasting and praying. That's already implied. You're fasting and praying for me. Do not eat or drink for three days. Or well, she, she, Don't cheat. She's like, you, you fast and pray for three days. Day and night. Notice how she has to say day and night. She, don't cheat. Don't you cheat. I know that Snickers looks good. Don't you cheat. 
I know that steak looks good, don't you, Chi? You pray for me for three days. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it's against the law, I will go in to see the king. I must die if I must die. Why fast? Anybody ever, I mean, anybody ever heard, like, you need to pray and fast. Like, why fast? So, Pastor, fasting is hard. It's not called slowing. Fasting is tough, man. Can I, can I imagine? I hate fasting physically. Spiritually, love it. I've had the best times of worship, sermon writing, book writing, devotionals, spiritual time with my wife when I'm fasting. Because fasting says I do without the world to starve myself for more of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in the New Testament, the disciples couldn't do some healing. He goes, because that's the kind of healing that only comes with prayer and fasting. Some of us want some stuff done in our lives. But God, I'm praying. God goes, I need you a little bit more. Here should be the hash. This should be the hashtag with fasting. How bad do you want it? How bad do you really want it? E e Esther says, pray and, and fast. We, we're just not gonna pray and indulge ourselves. We're gonna pray and fast and delight ourselves in the kingdom of God. Because I don't know what's next, but I guarantee you, if we pray about this, then God's gonna do something about it. You, 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 have, to, you have to sacrifice some stuff to have those, those prayers met. You, you know, Teresa and I, were, this year, August, will be our 26th wedding anniversary. And, and last year as, was 25, but because of COVID, so we've been saving all this money because we wanted to do like a big trip. Like, let's do Italy, girl. Let's go to Greece. Like, we're looking at all these places. Then COVID hits, everything shut down. You're like, man, I'm not gonna go to Greece and like hang out in the airport. Like, we're gonna do something that like we can go somewhere. So we, we said, maybe 26, maybe this will be the year we do something. But we, we, sa we sacrificed and saved to experience a great trip. Many of us want to experience a great trip with the Lord, but not willing to sacrifice and be obedient on the back end. You, gotta, you, you can't just have this. Esther goes, I'm going to go meet with the king, but you and I need to do some stuff on the back end and sacrifice a little bit to see what's going to happen. Listen, don't let prayer intimidate you. Let it inspire you. I talked to people all the time ago, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. Praying is just talking to God. It's just, um, okay, this is not my notes. Now, like you don't have, I'm just, this is off the top of my head. Prayer is simple. Prayer is simple. Can I give you an acronym? Prayer is simple. Simple. Number one, prayer is short. I think people think we have to have a long prayer. Prayer is short. You know the deepest, most aggressive prayer you can ever pray? God, use me. That's short. There's a lot in that statement. Simple, short, intimate. It's you and God. It's you and God. M, uh, uh, miracle focused. It's a hyphenated word. Miracle focused. <laughs> what you're saying is, God, if you don't show up, this ain't gonna happen. P, personal. God, I'm praying this for me. L, uh, loving. Loving. God, I love you. God, I love you more than anything. And, and E is expectant. Simple, short. Uh, <laughs> see, I, 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 you know what I'm talking about. You got it. Simple. Every now and then it comes to me fast. I was like, that was good what I said. Let's see if it happens to other services. Simple. The I will be something different next service. <laughs> Simple, individual. What? Anyway. Uh, Prayer. You know why? Because prayer, prayer, think about it like this. If I'm going into battle with the devil, the greatest passionate protection I can have is prayer on the front end. I'm gonna be prayed up before I jump into a fight with the devil. Many of us go into a fight with the devil, we're like, I was not prepared. You, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm going into this, and you're like, did you, did you ever talk to him about it first? You know, when I was a kid growing up, I loved sports. The only sport I could never play was hockey. I mean, growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, and I couldn't play hockey because the equipment was so expensive. It wasn't because I couldn't skate. I can't skate to save my life now. <laughs> but, but I couldn't play hockey because we didn't have a lot of money, and, and the, you had to have the right equipment. Do you, do you know why you have to right, have the right equipment? Have you seen hockey players? Homeboys have three teeth. You know, like, you gotta have gloves that are padded. Why? Because you got ice skates going over your hands. You gotta have, 
Helmets, you, you, the equipment is so expensive. Why in the world would quit equipment? Because you're going into one of the most dangerous sports on the planet. Have the right equipment for the right battle. Many of you are going into a battle with the devil and you don't have the right equipment. You gotta be prayed up. And Esther says, we are going to be prayed up. So what do you and I do when I have a hard time trusting the Lord? I'm Tebowing it. I'm, I'm going back to what I know because going back to what I know shows I depend on who I know. So, so Esther says, let's go to prayer. Let's go to prayer. So when you have a hard time trusting, I'm gonna pray. Here's the second thing. And then I'm gonna pray. And then I'm gonna jump through the God anointed opportunity when it arises. If you're praying for an opportunity, can I tell you something? God will give you the opportunity. The opportunity is not the issue. The issue is, are you jumping through it when it comes? You know why you and I don't, don't th jump through it when it comes? Because it's not the opportunity you thought would be coming. Oh no, God, not that one. You said you'd serve anywhere, but I meant on platform, not in kids. No, no, but you, you said, you said. But look what happens here. On the third day of the fast, I love that homegirl waited all three days. Day two, she didn't go, I'm going, I'm hungry. She waited all three days. Esther put on her royal robes, entered the inner court of the palace just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne, facing the entrance, and when he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out his, what you're praying for. And the Bible says, Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. What they were praying for is, I have no, I have no, problem here with going before the king. The only problem is he doesn't want me. He calls for you. But if he holds out the gold scepter, then I'll be welcomed. When God presents an opportunity for you, you've got to jump through the opportunity you were praying for. This is the problem. With some, why, why? Because, because God God's want, wants to use you. Let me say it like this. I heard it said, I think it was uh, St. Augustine that said, um, you got to pray like it all depends on God, work like it all depends on you. Do you know why? Because the Bible says faith without works is. And what you and I do is we pray for a God-ordained opportunity, but you never have the gumption to jump through it when it arises. Can I, get, can I just be, can I, can I say it like I wanna say it? Are we okay here? Like let's, God, bless me financially. I'd love to, but you never tithe. God, bless me with a Christian man. I love to, but all you date is non-Christian men. God, bless me with godly relationships. I love to, but you never jump into a crew. God, bless me with serving opportunities. I love to, but you never sign up to serve. And we're getting real yet. But do you see what I'm saying? I got my own stuff too. I got God all the time going, Sean, you're praying for this, asking for this, but you're not doing it. Do you know how we found this building church? We were looking for this building, only not this building. <laughs> but I'm praying for a building and God's showing me other ones that kept getting a no, 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 no. I'm praying for God to do what I am actively seeking that I know he's going to do. What you and I need to do is just what Esther did. God, work a miracle in my life. God, work a miracle in my life. And I'm walking in faith because I know you're gonna do it. I'm not sitting back and wanting you to do. I'm asking God, and here I am. Use me. What will you have me do next? Faith. I'm walking in, I'm walking in, in faith. Esther's praying. And then imagine Imagine that pit in her stomach, the anxiety, the fear when she's praying a fast for three days, looking at her watch. Not her watch, probably the sundial. <laughs> and Esther goes, three days a day, three days a day. But I gotta do what I know I gotta do. And if I gotta die, then I'm gonna die. But I'm just not gonna keep praying for deliverance and not ever walk in it. When you have a hard time trusting God, you pray with passion that God will do what he says he will do. And then when the opportunity presents itself, even if you're like, I'm not for sure, you go, that's it. That's it. And then you gotta trust that God always has a plan. You're praying for a plan. You're stepping out into the opportunity of the plan, but then you gotta know God's got a plan. 
Look what happens here in the story. Then the king asked Esther, what do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I'll give it to you even if it's half the kingdom. Do you think homeboy loves her? I mean, this is a girl he hasn't known that long. We're talking 14, 15 years old. She becomes queen because he gave Vashti the boot and she comes in unannounced and you know what's on her mind and what she's thinking and the king goes, Esther, what do you want? If it's half the kingdom, it's all yours. Now, can I, can I tell you what I would have done? Can I be honest with you? I'd have spilled the beans right there. I'd have ruined God's plan. What is it that you, I'd be like, oh, he likes me. Let me tell you, Haman's a jerk. I'm a Jew, Mordecai's a Jew. Mordecai saved your life. He's trying to kill us, kill him. And, but, but, but notice the maturity, spiritual maturity of a 14-year-old, 15-year-old girl being led by the Holy Spirit to allow God's plan. Do you know what you and I do? We rush the blessing of God while it's half-baked. Y'all ever put that cake out of the oven too soon? It falls in the middle. Should have left it in. You pull that blessing of God out a little too quick because you want what you want in your time. And God goes, it needs to bake a little bit longer because I'm not finished yet. And Esther replied, if it pleases the king, let King and Haman come today to a banquet. What? A banquet? What? The plan is just starting to come together. Esther goes, what I really would like today is, King, if you can invite Haman, I want to throw a party today for you and Haman because you guys are special. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. And while they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther, now tell me what you really want. If it's half my kingdom, I'll give it to you. And Esther replied, once again, notice God's working it. This is my request and deepest wish. If I have found favor with the king and if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I ask, please come to Haman. Please come with Haman tomorrow to a banquet I'll prepare for you. Then I'll explain what this is all about. I love this. She goes, I'm gonna have a banquet for you today invite Haman. Haman shows up. Now, you know, Haman's arrogant. He's loving. He's like, oh, that's what's up. And the king's whispering to Esther's ear and goes, okay, now what do you really want? You, you, you know, it's, it's Mother's Day. Wives, you know, your husband brings home the flowers. What do you really, like, what, what do you really want, Esther? Oh, today, this party wasn't enough. Tomorrow, let's have another one. Let's let the plan of God marinate a little bit more. Why? Because sometimes you can't tell people. You got to let God show people. Sometimes you got to let it just marinate and work. Let's take a pause from Esther for a second and think through the Bible of how many times people rushed the blessing of God when it wasn't fully baked. God by the name of Abraham. God comes to Abraham at 75 years old. Homeboy is retiring. Got a lot of money. He is loving it. His plan is to play golf and shuffleboard all day long. And God goes, hey, I know you have no kids, but you look at the stars in the sky. I'm going to give you a bunch of kids. And he's like, I'm 75, dog. I don't think so. Like, I don't think so. God goes, no, no, you're gonna, like, I'm, I'm, I'm building a nation out of you. And at 86 years old, still no kid. And Abraham's going, God, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I'm doing my part. But Lord, I'm getting old. My wife's getting old. I, and Sarah, his wife goes, maybe we need to take it in our own hands. Here's my servant, sleep with her. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Abraham should like, that should have been a test. Abraham should have been like, no, no. Abraham's like, okay. <laughs> 86 years old, has a son named Ishmael. You talk about hatred between the Muslims and the Jews. Like, you, you see what's happening here because he took it in his own hands, and God goes, 
you did that yourself. I've been letting the plan bake so you'd have a kid at 100 years old, 25 years after I told you to have it so that no one could think it was actually you in some suspicious way. I want everyone to know it was a miraculous way and you tried to force it when it wasn't ready. And sometimes what you and I have to do is in the middle of all the stuff that we don't think is possible, just trust God that he can make the impossible possible. But God, it's been 25 years. I know it is. Wait one more week. Just, just, just wait one more week. When the facts are against you, the feelings are against you, when the failures are against you, when everything's against you, what do you do? You trust in what God said more than in what you see. Because you and I trust what we see and it fails you every time. And Esther goes, God's got a plan. I'm trusting the plan. Now, check this out. Let's go back to the story. Remember, you and I, we're prayed up. We're looking for the opportunity. The opportunity's coming. We're gonna trust that God has a plan in the middle of all this and check out the story. So Haman leaves the first banquet and goes home to his wife and tells his wife, you're not gonna believe this, baby. Esther had a banquet for me today and another banquet tomorrow. Am I well-liked or what? And as he's walking home to his wife to tell his wife how great he is, he sees Mordecai and it makes him so mad because Mordecai is the guy that doesn't bow. And so he goes home to his wife and he's having the best day of his life, but he gets mad. You know how you are sometimes on Instagram when you're scrolling through pictures and see an ex-girlfriend, you're like, oh. Like, so he's, he's, he's mad because he's all on cloud nine and sees Mordecai and tells his wife, the king loves me so much, Esther loves me so much, but I'm so mad because I saw Mordecai and I wanna kill him. Now, let's talk about this wife. The wife says, well, you know what you should do? Kill him. Thank you. God bless you. The kids jump in. Haman's kids jump in. How are those kids? Kill him, daddy. <laughs> the Bible says his whole family jumps in. His friends jump in. Kill him. Kill him, dad. The, 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 the Bible says that the wife says, hey, before you go to the party tomorrow, you want to enjoy the party. So tonight, build a 75-foot-high sharpened pole. In the morning, hang Mordecai on it, kill that joker, and enjoy the party because Mordecai's dead. And the kids are like, do it, Dad. So, so the, now listen, what do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do when you trust God and God's got a plan and the plan's working and then all of a sudden, the plan that you thought God was working looks like death? You still trust the deliverance. Because you know the devil will make God's plan of deliverance look like death before you get it. Jesus died. Three days later, you trust the plan. The Bible says Haman's wife and all his friends suggested set up a sharpened pole 75 feet high, hang Mordecai on it. So check this out. Check this out. Haman goes to the king that night now, remember, this is all a story unfolding. Haman goes to the king that night because he's already setting up the sharpened pole and he's going to ask the king to kill Mordecai in the morning. And at the same time, Haman's walking to the palace. The king is having a hard time sleeping. How does God work? I wonder why. Now, remember, when Mordecai saved his life, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Remember when Mordecai saved his life? It was written in the king's book. And so Haman is on his way to see the king. King Xerxes can't sleep, and King Xerxes says, can you bring out the royal book and read me the royal book? I need to find out just a little bit that's happening in the lives of my people. So he's laying in bed. Someone's feeding him grapes. They've got a pump. And someone reads that Mordecai saved his life, and he goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mordecai saved my life? Oh, he saved my, what, what, do we, what, what do we do for him? At the same time, he's saying all this about Mordecai. Haman walks in to ask for the death of Mordecai on a steel pole. And Xerxes go, just the man I wanted to see. What would you do if there's a man that honors you and honors you so much, he's given everything for you? What would you do for the man that, and Haman's so arrogant. Haman goes, it's me, it's me, it's me. He goes, I'll tell you what I would do, king. I take your royal robe and put it on him. I take that man and put him on the royal horse. And then I'd have that royal robe wearing 
dude on the horse be carried around the whole city with a guy that loves you and knows you. And I would shout, this is what happens to a man the king honors. This is what happens to a man the king honors. And Xerxes goes, that's right, do that for Mordecai. And the king goes, and don't leave out a detail. And Haman, you be the one to lead him around. <laughs> when it looks like death, you got to trust deliverance. I know what the doctor's report says, but I know my God. I know you just got divorced, but I know my God. I know you just declared bankruptcy, but I know my God. I know it looks bleak, but I know my God. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't either, but I know who holds tomorrow. You got to know at the end of the day who your only source of hope is. I'm praying, I'm trusting, I'm jumping, I'm walking through the anointing. I know what's happened. I'm trusting even when it's death, I'm trusting God's plan of deliverance because I know at the end of the day, my hope my hope is found in nobody else. Now remember, Haman's setting up this pole for Mordecai. Xerxes says, go lead Mordecai all around the city. Haman leads Mordecai all around the city. It's uh, 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 and, and he, Haman goes back to his wife. Remember the wife that goes, kill him. Esther 6, that night the king had trouble sleeping. He ordered the attendant, now you and all this part. He said this to, to his attendants, nothing has been done for him. Now let's go to Esther 6, chapter 10. Excellent, the king said to Haman, quick, take the robes, do all that. Take care of him, do what I said he would do. And the Bible says that the story goes on, that he goes back to his wife and he says to his wife, babe, I don't know what just happened. The king loves Mordecai. And I'm building a pole that you told me to build to kill him. And his wife goes, oh, mistake bad mistake. Don't be telling the king you want to kill Mordecai because the king loves Mordecai now. And Haman says to his wife, what do I do? And just as he says, what do I do? The servants come and whisk him away to the next banquet the next day for the king and Haman. He has no idea what to do. No plot. You know why? Because he ain't prayed up. He's too arrogant to pray up. He ain't focused. He's self-centered. He's er he wants death. And God goes, I'll give you just what you want. What's going to happen, Sean? I don't know. Come back next week. I don't know, but I know who. I don't know what, but I know who. What do I do when I don't know? What do I do when I'm planning a church in Port St. Lucie? I don't know. I know you keep praying. You keep trusting. You, keep, you walk through the opportunity and God goes, I know who you know who I am. What do you do when you start a church with $3,000? I know what you're gonna do. I, I take care of you. I take care of you. You may not know what to do, but I, I know who's in charge. What do you do when you ask for a 30,000 square foot building? You're looking for one that fits 200 people. God knows. God knows. Come on, stand to your feet. Because here's the beauty, church. Let me close with this. When you start seeing God come through, it builds your confidence and faith to know that in the future, he'll come through. I remember as a first in ministry, we'd have people come up and ask Teresa to pray for them. We have this going on. We have cancer. We have this. We have... Can you pray for healing for us? And I'm sitting here praying like, I'm so inadequate to pray. And I'm praying like kind of halfway believe but at the same time going, God, you can do this. And they come back two weeks later and go, guess what? Cancer is gone. I'm like, really? But you know what that did? 30 years of ministry later, I'm going, let's pray right now because I know what my God can do. He might choose to not do it, but I'm believing he can because that's my God because I trust him. And the more he pours into your confidence, the more you have confidence that he will move out of you. You know what? My son Austin played football. I'll close with this story. My son Austin, I, I coached his, his teams growing up, soccer and, and football. And uh, very first year I ever co coached Austin's team, flag football. We went to the Super Bowl. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's not about me. Uh, <laughs> we won. <laughs> uh, but anyway, but that year, that season, every single game, Austin's team was so good, they would go into the game and somebody would say, who are we playing? And the team would go, doesn't matter. We're winning. You, you, you have a different confidence when you know you're winning. We should be walking out of here like, 
What's happening tomorrow? I don't know, but I know who's in it. What's the doctor report say? I don't know, but I know who holds it. What's your bank account say? I don't know, but I know who can fill it. I know who I know. Doesn't matter what it looks like, it's who he is. Man, maybe you're here today and maybe you're going, man, my life has just been one bad turn after another. I don't know what to do. I'll tell you the only thing to do is to say yes to Jesus. That's the trust. That's where the trust starts. The trust starts with you putting your life in his hands. That's the trust. Go, God, I just, I, I need you. You're in charge. You're in control, God. You gotta say, here it is. Here's my life. And, and you give it to God because he can do more with it than you can. If you're here today, you've never said yes to Jesus. I'm gonna ask you to be bold. And I'm gonna ask you in just a second to raise your hand. You might say, Sean, why do you have me raise my hand? I mean, I, can I just say, you could say yes, but I want you to raise your hand because on a planet full of 7 billion people, you raise your hand and God goes, I see that fingerprint. I know that hand. That's a fingerprint like nobody else's. I made that hand. That's my hand. I created that hand. And I'm glad today you're trusting me with it. So on the count of three, if you wanna say yes to Jesus and trust your whole life to him, just raise your hand. One, two, three, just raise your hand. Raise up high so I can see it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I can't see a thing, so if you raised it, congratulations. And if you didn't, but you raised it in your heart, God still knows. God still knows. We're all gonna pray this prayer out loud together because I'm believing God's working in somebody's life right now. Come on, bow your heads. Let's all pray this together. Just say, dear Jesus, today I'm surrendered to you. Today I'm focused on you. Today, I give you my life. Fill my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my past and make me brand new. And for the rest of my life, I'll follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, Nicker, let's celebrate all those that prayed that prayer. Come on, let's lift our hands together because with Jesus, we're all good. Come on, lift your hands up. Let's begin to sing it together.